Welcome, everyone. This is uh, Bill Code, of course, and my colleague here, Christina Mitz. Christina is a well nutrition trained as well as a therapist at uh, our Team Out Canada facility. And so she's become extremely knowledgeable over the last couple of years on the microbiome as well. So we're going to focus a little bit on microbiome, or primarily today, and kind of to try and tie it all together for you. Even to the end, at the end point, we will be talking about, you know, the ultimate intervention, which would be potentially gut floral transplant, which has been up till now talked about as fecal microbial transplant. Doesn't seem like a good marketing term to me. Um, however, that's the one that's in the literature, but we need to define what is the difference between those two things as well. So before getting into that part, I want to bring you partly to an update. Many of you will be aware of the shifts around COVID-19, of course. Some places are still struggling a lot with diagnoses and the increased frequency of those, as well as, you know, the intensive care step, which tends to happen in a fairly small percentage of people. I think the people that hit the door of the hospital, it could be as low as 5% will need the final steps of potential intubation. And that's always what we've talked about is to try and minimize the people pushing all at once toward our hospital scenarios, whether it's here in Canada or whether it's across the United States or anywhere in the world, so that your ordinary health supports facilities, such as hospitals and intensive cares, don't get all at once overburdened. And hence the concept of smoothing the curve or flattening the curve as opposed to the steep curve, you know, which we saw very much of for example, in Italy and even Spain, and even now somewhat in the UK. It's an important distinction to make because many places, and most of you will know the West Coast of the United States and Canada seems to be relatively less afflicted. There's a whole bunch of suggestions around that. But I think, you know, as we are now a little over a month into this in the majority of places, it's time, as they're starting to do, to make changes to open up the restriction. And it's a touchy time, as most of you will know. Um, there was major protests in Berlin, at least hundreds of people. And then again, yesterday in Michigan, in the United States, where thousands of people were taking to the streets and upset. We have to remember to walk a line. It's not like the medieval period where the only chance we had of looking after a virus such as this, A, we didn't understand what they were at that time, and B, you know, we knew quarantine was the only solution we had. Well, quarantining is useful for flattening the curve, but when you flatten the curve, you still don't predict that almost everybody will not be infected. The reckoning is that most of us will have this within what? Within a year, 70 to 80 percent of us will have had this COVID-19 virus. The lethality or the, or the fatalities from it, if you take the entire population, the best guesstimate out of the Lancet article last week was 0.6 percent. Okay, that's not 3 percent, it's not 10 percent, it's 0.6 percent. So that's roughly one-sixth of what an ordinary influenza virus would do because when an influenza virus counteracts it, it comes through a community, goes through a care home, nursing care home, it's fairly devastating and people lose are lost all the time because that's a very vulnerable group. So somewhere we have to find a mix because if you take away people's mobility and social interaction completely for very long, it's got its own downside consequences. So. I certainly would never advocate social unrest, but I would encourage the people that are in charge of things to start to look at both parts of the equation. So in doing that, you know, I think I'd mentioned earlier, Germany seemed to have a really good monitoring people at home because we know now that some people go home and they seem pretty good and then all of a sudden they're worse. So it's interesting where we live on Vancouver Island, um, at the west side of Canada, 
they've instituted more of this monitoring at home, just as of recently as yesterday. So now if you go to the hospital and have a diagnosis or a possibility that you have COVID-19 and they send you home, then often they are linking you up with a nurse who will give you two things to make sure that you have at home, and that's a thermometer and a pulse oximeter or an oxygen saturation monitor. And then they will be checking in with you, plus or minus maybe a tablet to give the indication on, to see how you are doing so that they know when things change. And I think this is brilliant. I'm really happy to see it because it's again, using technology to improve the outlook. This is being talked a lot by the functional medicine people in the United States so that family doctors and others can help monitor people at home. And there they're often using blood pressure and temperature. I'm hoping that they will soon add the pulse oximeter. You know, for 40 to $100, you get a lot of information. And because the sudden change we don't want to miss is when the lungs don't perform adequately and we drop our oxygen. So I think with those pieces in mind, there's much more we know to treat things. In addition, there's all kinds of things happening. I think there's now getting to be a lot of knowledge about antibody testing. When has one already had the virus? And we can see that with antibodies. I think we're still a little uncertain how long they last in the body. They probably last several weeks for sure. And hopefully they would last a year or longer, but no one knows yet until we've measured it and studied that. And I know those steps are happening parts in Europe and I'm sure parts in China and and Japan, but we need to stay in touch as a world so that all these pieces are happening. I would hope that we do antibody testing first on our healthcare workers. I mean, they're on the front lines, interacting people with who usually are sick with COVID-19 before they get to the hospital. And so they are more at risk and so are their families. And so in fact, many of them in Europe we're not even going home, so they didn't risk their families. So we need to let those people know, do they have antibody already? And therefore, they are more likely to, to be able to continue to work without taking down the virus. So our healthcare worker, I think they we owe it to them, and they're our frontline people, to test them for antibodies first. Can they cope? or not and be now relatively immune to the virus COVID-19. So I think on all those pieces we've spent the last two or three sessions talking about the microbiome and I wanted to outline it a bit and then I'm going to hand it over to to uh, Christina to kind of go through what she's created as a nice summary to give you the idea of the concepts again of microbiome. I wanted to talk about the little different micro habitats or niches within the body. Okay, we talked in the last session about mouth microbiome. And short summary of the mouth is it's primarily aerobic bacteria, meaning that they tolerate oxygen and they need oxygen, except when you've got gum disease or gingivitis or abscesses or, you know, a flaring root canal, then you've almost always got anaerobic or no oxygen. This is more closely to the colon, where that's why stool cultures don't work well, and we'll talk a bit more about that, because those, as soon as they get exposed to air, die. So then if we move up a little bit from the mouth to the nose, then we know that that again is also mostly aerobic, except if you get a nasty sinusitis and you get regions where the air is absorbed, now you can have anaerobic bacteria. And I'll leave it to, to Christina to talk about because sometimes it's a good, so-called good bacteria, which is now awry because it's in the wrong place at the wrong time and overly dominant. Okay. So the nose and the mouth are incredibly important because that's the most common way for us to take in um, COVID-19 virus. And that's a very common approach for most things. And often it lingers there several days. And that's why we want you to focus on the health of those, of the nose and the mouth. And of course, even to some degree, the the liquid areas or conjunctiva around the eyes, because 
if those are in good health with their healthy, normal bacteria, they're going to be much more resistant to the problem of the buildup of viruses. The viruses are particularly nasty against some of the epithelial cells in the mouth and nasal pharynx. And then after several days, of course, all of the air that we breathe in with or without extra oxygen goes in through the mouth or nose to the lungs and eventually gets to the lungs. So let's talk a little bit about the passageway. So in a non-smoker, because smokers, everything is often more out of kilter than ever. There's that single layer of epithelium goes down through the windpipe or trachea. And that has a lot of parallels with the airway because it also is high in oxygen. So in normal scenario, the microbiome of the airways and lungs has, anaer has aerobic, meaning oxygen tolerating bacteria. When these go awry, then it can have anaerobic and that's a problem. So what makes them go awry? Well, one is the increased amount of food because when one has a viral infection, you all know that you get a lot more mucus and some of this goes into the airway. And within that mucus, it's a food scenario for the microbiome in the lungs. At the same time, it's carrying bacteria with it, all right? So this can change very much the microbiome within the lungs. The other feature that happens in this or in someone with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, the airways aren't working optimally and often they've lost their cilia, the little brush borders that are along the airways, which move the bacteria out again. And that's completely gone, unfortunately, in smokers. But it can recover, it takes three to six months, but it can recover. So. The other feature that happens in something like asthma or COPD or eventually happens in COVID-19 is that the airways become swollen. This is the word inflammation again, right? And so now maybe you're not getting enough oxygen in through the lungs and as a consequence in that area, you're also getting lack of oxygen, which is now hypoxia. And hypoxia is another spurred issue along with some of the pathogenic bacteria in this case, to trigger off the so-called cytokine storm or big time inflammation in the lungs. And if this is extreme enough, sometimes you even need ventilation, okay? So that's kind of how it all fits together. We know enough about this virus that we don't like to intubate people. And I very much have my hat off to the folks that are running the intensive cares because they don't go lightly to intubation because it's a tricky way to solve things and you've got a whole set of other issues. And once you get to intubation, your chances of full recovery are quite a bit reduced. So the more we can do things ahead of time to prevent that, the better. And then of course, the other microbiome you're maybe not as much thinking about is of course the stomach and the duodenum because these have bacteria too. Very low pH or high acidity in the stomach and then it, of course, becomes quite relatively more basic once you get to the duodenum. And then eventually you get all the way down to the colon or large bowel. And that pH is there something like five. Exactly. Which is a relatively on the acidic side. And that's based on the bacteria within it. So I wanted to kind of lay that out as a, as a backdrop in that we have these microbiome niches throughout us. And the other one, of course, we forget to talk about is the skin because it's there, too. And the skin can be all well and good and can protect us a great deal. But if you get a break in the skin or a really major health problem, such as eczema, which becomes infected or all these other issues, then the barrier is gone. And now the microbiome can become a negative instead of a protective feature. Um, so I think with that, why don't I turn it a little bit over to you? Yeah, that sounds good. The other part. Um, maybe we'll just answer one question. So Sandra's asking, is a double layer cloth mask suitable to wear outdoors to protect others or does it need an inner filter? Okay. It probably is, will handle most things. The things it won't handle will be the major sneeze. Okay. Coughs are one thing and, you know, the secretions are fairly large usually, but a sneeze is huge. 
And it's quite a propulsive force, almost like a jet force. So that probably will not be covered. But if one does the ordinary protective things with the sneeze, then that double layer of mask will probably work as well. They're not 100%. We have to recognize and realize that. So, but they are a help and they're an effort that people are really trying. And so the N95 masks, which is a so-called gold standard, are in incredibly short supply. So the other double cloth mask is probably as reasonable as any. And then try and find which cloths work better. Often it's cottons that tend to be better tolerated of a fairly close weave. Maybe some of you can find a wool that is. I'm always big on natural fibers personally. Okay, so that's great. What I want to do is just cover some of the basics, some of the things that we've covered before, and then get into more detailed areas about the microbiome. So if you were with us um, four Facebook Lives ago, you'll remember that we were talking about Louis Pasteur and germ theory. So in the beginning of his work, Louis Pasteur um, was really pushing the idea that germs are bad, bacteria are bad, and these are the root of all of our issues and all of disease. And then by the end of his career, he was thinking more, no, it's not the germ, it's actually the terrain. So there's all of these things that come together um, that encourage your microbes to act in one way or another. So in some, in one sense, your microbes are act actually kind of like your children. If you don't have children, maybe they're like your pets. Um, so they're only going to behave as well as um, the directions that you give them or the environment that you create for them. So a really good example of this is E. coli. Most of us have heard of E. coli. There are a lot of different species of E. coli, but it tends to get demonized. Um, and that is because there are a couple species of E. coli that have more capacity to behave poorly. But in reality, all of the E. coli species, even the pathogenic ones, do things for us. So they create B vitamins, they create vitamin K, and they actually break down uh, lactose for us. So there's some really great things that E. coli do and we wouldn't necessarily want to demonize all of them. So another piece to this um, terrain picture is pH. So like Bill was mentioning, each of the different areas of the body has a different pH and there are different microbes that are going to thrive in that pH. So in the gut microbiome, at least in the colon, we we do want to see a pH of about five, which is more on the acidic side, and that promotes growth of beneficial microbes and helps to prevent growth of proteobacteria, which tend to be more pathogenic type species. Next up would be substrate availability. So what types of things are actually available for your microbes to feed on? Are you feeding them anything at all? If they lack food entirely, they're actually going to go ahead and start um, degrading parts of your intestine, and then you're going to become more susceptible to things like food sensitivities. If you're feeding your microbes plenty of sugar, you're going to end up with more species like candida growing. And if you're feeding them lots of different processed foods, or if you have a lot of exposure to chemicals, and heavy metals, then you're going to end up with the types of microbes that are able to metabolize or deal with those things, or at least live in an environment where those things are constantly passing through. Um, next up would be your microbes are social creatures. So they're actually extroverts and they're really smart. They like to have a lot of um, diversity within their social groups. So they don't just want to hang out with their family and friends. They actually want their enemies around as well because they know that they can learn things from having different opinions in their environment. And so your microbes communicate with each other via different chemicals um, and they let each other know what's going on, who's there, and in what quantities, and that is what helps keep them in check. So they keep each other in balance. Um, if everything is harmonious, we shouldn't actually need to do anything at all besides provide the right types of food for them, and they keep each other in check. So all of that being said, there are some really common myths and concerns that I hear from our clients that I'd love to go through. Um, so number one, and I've already kind of mentioned this already, but germs are bad and if it's a pathogen, it's really bad. Um, so like I mentioned already, not all 
microbes, not all bugs are bad. I mentioned E. coli as an example of this. Uh, C. difficile would be another one that because of that specific microbe, I've heard people demonizing entire groups of microbes. So C. difficile is part of the family uh, Clostridia. And we definitely, we don't want to demonize all of Clostridia because again, they provide benefit for us. They provide the short chain fatty acid butyrate and they help pr produce different vitamins and break down different substances for us. Number two uh, myth would be that prebiotic fibers feed all microbes or that prebiotic fibers can be harmful if you're already having tummy issues. Um, so some of the things that I hear from our clients is that um, if they have something like IBS or IBD, um, the first line of treatment recommended for them, they went to their GP and they were told to take something like Metamucil, prunes, um, flax or psyllium husk. And when they did that, they ended up feeling a lot more discomfort, a lot more bloating, gas, and maybe even brain fog. And so the reason for that would be that um, you may have been prescribed the wrong type of fiber for your situation, or maybe you tried taking the fiber at the wrong time in relationship to your treatment plan. So um, again, common myth here that prebi prebiotic fibers feed any and all microbes. That's just not true at all. So um, you can actually feed specific groups of microbes with specific types of fiber. So we've been talking a lot about bifidobacteria in relation to the coronavirus and the prebiotic fiber that feeds most bifidobacteria is galacto-oligosaturides. And so you're going to find galacto-oligosaturides in legumes for your plant source, but then also in dairy or breast milk would be another sort of source of galacto-oligosaturides. So again, that fiber is going to feed mostly bifidobacteria and not that many other types of bacteria. Another good example for the prebiotic fiber would be partially hydrolyzed guar gum, also known as sun fiber. So it's important to know that partially hydrolyzed guar gum is different from regular guar gum. So if you see guar gum on the side of a package in the grocery store or on some sort of food, know that that's uh, like a food thickener and you don't necessarily want to take that. But the partially hydrolyzed bit is important um, because that's what actually makes it accessible for your microbes. And with the partially hydrolyzed guar gum, you end up feeding mostly species like Rosaburia or um, the butyrate producing microbes. And again, butyrate being one of your short chain fatty acids that's really, really important for modulating the environment of your gut, uh, for reducing inflammation, for promoting motility um, and establishing connection between uh, your gut and brain. So just while you're, you're setting up the next one, we've had uh, a really good comment from in from uh, Dagmar. So thanks for that. So I talked a little bit about masks and you know, the double cloth mask. But remember, within five minutes or less of you putting on a mask, that mask really becomes the same as your lips or your nose, okay? Because you're breathing through it all the time and things are going back and forth in the water droplets. So the key thing, before you put on a mask, okay? You know, wash your hands really thoroughly and maintain all the same principles. And do never, never think that the mask is taking away that risk of you touching your face in the T section, meaning around the eyes, nose, and mouth, because it's penetrating through it and it's continuous with it. So ideally, you would not be touching your mask and certainly not be, you know, touching others after you touch the mask. And then when you go to take home and take the mask off, I then go through that really thorough two-minute hand washing. That's really important, okay? Soap and water, still number one. Antibacterial soaps, don't cut it. They don't take down the virus risk at all. In fact, they probably worsen you. And you never want one with triclosan in it, of course. Those have been banned by the FDA for the last four years. But of course, for the same reason, you don't want the triclosan in your mouth, you know, even though it's in almost all toothpaste still today, tragically. So, um, just a reminder, the mask is only an extension of yourself, and that's why they're not the be-all and end-all. They're somewhat helpful, and it means that you're trying, but it's the biggest thing is to handle that sneeze and don't think that the mask is going to handle it. Sorry, back to the microbiome. 
Okay. Let's go get some other ones. And if you are at the doctor and the doctor is prescribing you fiber for gut problems and you think you have something like IBS or maybe even IBD or some other type of gut related imbalance, there's a chance that you might need to use antimicrobials, whether that's herbal or antibiotic before you start taking fiber. Um, so there is kind of like a correct order depending on what the situation is for you. So if you don't tolerate fiber right off the bat, don't feel bad. Um, it's just, it's your unique situation. Uh, we can't expect everyone to respond the same and we can't re expect our microbes to respond the same to these different fibers that the doctors are prescribing. And you might need to edge forward slowly. Exactly. You know, we call it titrating when we do it with drugs. You know, sure, you, you had a big whack. I mean, we were uh, visiting Europe, so happy to find a, a celiac friendly restaurant at a big whack of pasta paid for it for eight to 12 hours after, because it was all that fiber. I think this one was corn-based, didn't handle it well at all. If I'd had a, you know, a spoonful, probably would have been fine. But mm -hmm. if I had, you know, a plateful, not a good idea. So anytime you're starting the fibers, I would work up very gradually, and that may increase your ability to handle them, or you'll find out, and then you won't have as aggravating a time. If you're already having a problem with small amounts, small amounts, fine, put it on the shelf. You don't necessarily have to throw it away. Maybe a month from now, we'll have, you'll have yourself settled or healed enough with your gut pathway that you can maybe handle it. Mm -hmm. And I know I personally have been through the whole IBS journey myself. And in my earlier days of having gut problems, uh, I thought I couldn't tolerate any fiber at all. And I literally, I thought the fiber, I thought fiber was the devil. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to handle fiber. Um, but it did take kind of learning a bit more about what was going on with my body and then trying out different types of fiber. So the first one that ended up working for me was the partially hydrolyzed guar gum. And I was like, oh, great, here we go. And that kind of helped me get a step ahead. And then from there, I was, I was able to add more and more things in. Um, so you might find that... Um, it's similar for you if you're if you're dealing with IBS. So my third favorite myth, microbiome myth that I hear from clients uh, is that they've used one of these seven to 10 day gut cleanses out of a box that they've seen in the grocery or health food store. And they're usually labeled like parasite cleanse, paragon, candida cleanse, something like that. And they're marketed as these shiny, colorful, easy to use, maybe even sexy and clean um, cleanses for your gut and they're gonna fix all your problems. But really that's not the case. So, um, I mean, number one, your the terrain of your gut takes quite a while to shift and it's not gonna shift in seven to 10 days. Um, so it can take about four to six weeks for you to start making changes and for us to start seeing changes that are um, that are that are actually happening within the microbiome and it can take years for you to actually change the baseline of your gut um, so you're not going to see permanent changes from doing something for just seven to ten days it's interesting though one clever thing that they do when they market those they usually put you on a fairly restrictive diet mm -hmm. while you're on that. So you're often off all gluten, maybe off all grains and off all processed foods. You're going to eliminate alcohol. So part of the time that you maybe think you're feeling good because of the cleanse, it's because you've made these other adaptations. So, you know, just keep that in mind when you're doing it. Sometimes you will do as well with those adaptations to temporarily start to feel better because you may be taking out one of the key insult or challenging pieces to your own gut. Yeah, I mean, no matter what, if you go from a SADS, a standard American diet to some other type of diet, there's always gonna be benefits had. And that's part of the um, obstacle, obstacles that we come across with nutrition studies in general is that we never know, okay, well, what was this group of people, were, what type of diet were they coming from in the first place? Um, so the second reason that those gut cleanses in a box aren't going to work is because they're often focused on the antimicrobial piece. And so again, if you were with us on Tuesday, you heard, heard us mention scorched earth policy. So you can't just take out everything and expect 
the good bacteria are going to be the ones to come back. It doesn't always work like that. Often our gut has first responders. So, I mean, candida tends to be one of the first responders if we've taken antibiotics or taken a lot of herbal antimicrobials. And it thinks it's doing us a favor by coming in and um, showing up. But uh, yeah, so we can't, we can't just expect that taking a ton of antimicrobials is going to fix all of our problems and that the good ones are going to be the ones to come back. And I, I think one of the first responders in the gut, and this comes back from my time in the 1980s working in intensive care, we would often, with a fever of uncertain origin and we knew the person was sick, we would put them on a triple antibiotic treatment, okay? And inevitably, the first one to come back was C. difficile, mm -hmm. Clostridium difficile. We didn't even realize it at that time, initially, perhaps. Um, but that's a fairly common scenario. It's one of the bacteria that are pretty resistant. The other interesting thing just to remember, and we maybe talked a little bit about before, is glyphosate or the Roundup component that's in many of our foods because it's used for desiccation in wheat, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and, and both of the sugars, you know, the, the cane sugar as well as the beet sugar. The glyphosate is an antibiotic as well. It was patented as such in 2010 or so by Monsanto, but it wipes out almost all of the good guys and the ones that come back and are resistant to it are the pathogenics, pathogenic groups. And that would be some of the very nasty components of E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, C. difficile, and so on. And so we're effectively doing that scorched earth policy every, a little bit every day, because every time we're eating one of those foods that are contaminated or the GMO foods, which of course are used by growing it in the presence of glyphosate or Roundup, all of a sudden, you know, we're creating our own problem every day. Yeah, well, no, we're not taking antibiotics from the doctor. I get that. But we are taking the antibiotics from Big Egg. And so that's not good for us. Exactly. Yeah, I also, I've seen some of these gut cleanses and they tend to contain a lot of really harsh herbs. So they'll contain things like uh, senna or the part of aloe from the leaf, which is more latex. So the outer leaf of aloe is latex and the inner part of the leaf is actually the gel part, but um, the outer part of the aloe and then also senna and there's a few other herbs that are often used can be really, really harsh on the gut um, and actually end up increasing inflammation if you use them for too long. And then uh, since we've already touched on candida, um, the candida cleanse has been something that's been marketed for, it's been really in our face for at least 10 years. Oh, if you have fatigue, if you have brain fog, if you have this and that, oh, well, it's candida. So you may as well do a candida cleanse. And again, it's like Bill says, usually it goes along with the diet. So you might see some improvement from doing the diet, um, but there could be something completely different going on for you. So we've had clients come into the clinic and they say, oh, well, I have, um, I have brain fog and I have sinus issues and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, when is the onset of those things? And it's after such and such food, say like beer or something with yeast or, um, sorry, yeast isn't a good example, um, say sauerkraut or something like that. Well, that's, that's a histamine response. Um, so you can, you can mix up symptoms from different issues with the candida issue and then end up treating the wrong thing with diet and with these super antimicrobial herbs when you don't even truly know what's going on with you. Um, so just overall, steer clear of those in a box gut cleanses that you see in a grocery store and really work to figure out what's going on with you first and take an approach that um, also incorporates the building up of your microbiome. So um, the use of fiber, the use of anti-inflammatory herbs, and don't use anything antimicrobial unless it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that gives us a nice, it's a little bit of a lead in because uh, within the next couple of weeks, we'll probably send a session talking about SIBO. SIBO of course is small intestine bacterial overgrowth it's a bit of a challenge. I, I think you've struggled with it. I've certainly struggled with it. It's it's not all that easy to treat, and yet it's a forerunner to other issues within us. Uh, SIBO can be either with diarrhea or with constipation. One's easier to treat than, than the other. This is relatively easier to diagnose than it was 10, 20 years ago. I, I don't think I'd even heard about it 10, 20 years ago. 
But in the last few years, often we have a test where they do a, a gas interpretation of what you're breathing out. So you're taking these samples and you're, what you breathe out for half an hour, I think. And uh, then those are sent off to the lab and then you find out what you're growing in it. But anyway, the SIBO issue is, is really important for a lot of initial gut symptoms, whether it's sometimes pain, sometimes it's bloating, sometimes it's heartburn, um, all these issues. And part of it, it goes against what we've been thought, taught over the years, which was a grazing method of eating. But often you want to be three and four hours between foods so that the ordinary gut motility works well because you may or may not know but all the way along the gut system there's a motor complex or a motor pathway and if it's working and moving things through things are much better but if it's not working things through sometimes secondary to medication i mean narcotics or opiates really block it badly but there's a lot of things interfere with that motor complex and you've got to get it normalized and working again to recover from that. And of course, SIBO, of course, is a microbiome variance. Yes, it's the microbiome in your, in your small bowel, but it's also the microbiome where there's a one or two or three pathogenic bacteria are much more dominating than they could be or should be. So it's all getting back to that balance. So SIBO is in your future if you keep an eye on us keep watching you're not going to be able to solve everything from what we're suggesting we're trying to point you in optional directions and it may seem really weird to be talking about all these things on the microbiome but the microbiome super matters because 70 to 80 percent of your immune system is all through your gut all right that's why you take the extra vitamin a because it helps all that work better appropriate um, four to 5,000 units a day of vitamin D. In the short term, the vitamin C, because it's antiviral to a great degree. But getting all of those things right, getting the microbiome optimal, and your immune system will work much better. 70 to 80%. If your microbiome is awry, you're gonna have an uphill battle, and you're gonna be much prone to major illness at the time of COVID-19 contact. Mm hmm. Exactly. And I think um, I'd like to touch a little bit on actually monitoring or understanding what's happening with your microbiome. So um, technology is moving in the direction of PCR or DNA based testing. So this is still stool testing. Right now, when you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital and you're doing a stool sample for them, that is culture based testing. So when they use culture based testing, they're only able to test for a select number or a select type of microbes. And generally, these end up being the aerobic type of microbes, they have to be oxygen tolerant for them to culture them. So they're taking some sort of medium, maybe it's agar, and they're growing the microbes on that and the microbes are being exposed to oxygen. So A, they need to be tolerant or able to grow on that specific medium and B, they need to be at least somewhat aerobic to be able to grow and those end up being the microbes that um, the lab technician will see. But the future of testing is, it, it's looking like it's gonna be a DNA and PCR based. So um, it doesn't matter what happens to the stool um, if there's a longer transit time, because it doesn't matter if it's exposed to air, they can just take these DNA fragments out of the stool and then learn what is there based on that. And we're also seeing, um, that things are moving in the direction of being more and more species specific, both with um, probiotic research as well as with microbiome research. So we already mentioned the other day um, with the Prevotella piece that it seemed like with coronavirus, um, what was coming up was there was a specific species of Prevotella, so not the whole Prevotella family that was an issue, but a specific species of Prevotella that was overgrown in those COVID. Uh, patients. So this is the direction we're moving in with testing. We want to be as species specific as possible um, so that we can make more um, more specific recommendations based on that. Because we're still trying to find out the microbiome. And this is, again, the microbiome optimal to you for what your previous experience has been, your genetic inheritance, and all the other variations that have 
happens, how that is skewed, sometimes with medication and sometimes to a very major degree. Uh, unfortunately, things like protein pump inhibitors and many of these medications are a real shift in your microbiome because some of them tolerate it and some of them do not. So it's working out what's the microbiome optimal for you. And of course, all of our DNA testing, I mean, we can thank all the efforts that was done on the human genome mapping, because that was, you know, 23,000 genes in it. It happened relatively quickly. We thought we would have all the answers for our ills at the time, and it didn't turn out as good because we were missing the component of the microbiome. Now, the microbiome has four to 10 times as many, you know, gene possibilities within it, or, or even more than that. And consequently, it's a whole bigger, bigger variety. But that is how we are. And remember, if you can optimize the good components of your microbiome, then your own personal epigenetics or how you are doing with your particular genes is much enhanced or improved. Because remember, vitamin D will help two to 3,000 genes. Extra oxygen will help the better function of 8,000 of your genes. But the microbiome, it could help up to 20,000 of your genes. And so that's why you need to spend some time and effort on it because it can optimally reduce your, your stroke risk, your heart attack risk, your heart failure risk, your obesity risk, and all the features, hypertension, all down the line by getting those pieces correct. And that's where the big challenge comes in from, you know, the integrated medicine people, functional medicine people, often, you know, some very good naturopaths can start to tease those pieces out and sort them. And for those, lose heart, don't lose heart, because for those of you who've got a really dramatically messed up microbiome, and despite all the best things you'd like to do, it's almost like you would like to get a transplant. Well, now you can do that. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. I talk about it in a chapter in my book. I think we'll put that chapter uh, online at my drbillco.com site so you can read it. But it talks about gut floral transplant. So gut floral transplant, it's a bit like fecal microbial transplant. You want to have really healthy donors. And our donors are done in a, in the UK, these are healthy, slim people, also tested for COVID-19. But those donors have all their stool tested for viruses and their body tested for viruses. And then their, their stool is stored, but before it's stored, it's spun down and all the poop components are removed. And with it are all the worries or issues about hormones, whether they're from a man or a woman and all these sorts of issues. These are dramatically reduced, and then they're stored at minus 80 for three months. At that end of the three months, at that time, that individual donor provider is tested again for all those significant viruses. And then, and only then, if they're all still clear of those viruses, because some of them are quite slow growing, then those would use, be used as a donor to supply an implant to a person getting gut floral transplant. So I went over and it's so over three years ago now that I went over to the United Kingdom, had that at Tame Out UK. And so then it was a matter of having a, some colonics before I left home, being on a stool softener, a relative stool cleanse in the system, usually magnesium based. And then when I went over there, they did another colonic and then they did my first installation of, or implant, which is done rectally. It's about 30 to 50 cc's not dramatically, it's diluted down in saline. You're trying to keep oxygen away from it because remember, almost all these organisms are anaerobic, meaning they don't survive in the presence of oxygen or from the outside air. And then that's instilled positioning, some degree of massage, so it goes through the entire colon. And then that's repeated from a different donor every day for 10 days, you get the weekend off. So that's kind of the pattern of how it was done then, I think that's reasonably close because Christina, you've been over to learn the systems from Tame Out UK and you're now an instructor of therapists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's pretty much exactly the same. And again, the goal just being to expose the person or to replenish as much microbial diversity as possible. So as we've been 
speaking about this, we've been saying the more diverse your microbiome is, the better your potential for overall health is, the better your um, epigenetics are going to be. Um, and so that's really the point of the whole program. Yeah. So, and people will often, I mean, I, I bought some extra at the time of and then brought those home and used those because most people learn how to do this at home. It's not something you want to start at home. Trust me. You don't want to start doing uh, fecal transplants from your best friend or your daughter or whatever, because A, you and your daughter will share a great deal of microbiome in the first place, but B, there's a lot of really important issues you don't want to injure yourself. The only couple of deaths that have occurred tend to have happened when people have taken these implants equivalents in capsules orally. And then in the worst case scenario, they put many of these capsules in their stomach, they vomit, and it goes into the lungs. So-called aspiration, they get a terrible pneumonia, and some people will die because that is not optimal. It's sometimes will work in treating things like C. difficile. However, it will not work near as well of reestablishing a microbiome within you of diversity and all these other issues as going into the colon. Because the colon, you know, the large bowel is the dominant place of bacterial growth within the body with some two kilograms, four to five pounds uh, being present in most of us. And the majority, not all of it, but the majority is in the large bowel. So that's why access through the rectum with that well-treated, optimal, healthy implant can do really well. And that's why, you know, I would rather people thought about it as a straightforward transplant between people, much, much simpler than a kidney or a liver transplant. Maybe a little bit with the simplicity of a corneal transplant, those sorts of deals, but no surgery required per se, but optimal preparation, optimal follow-up. In fact, I think part of a major part I know of, of your treatment of people is to coach them, encourage them, first of all, to take away some of the very irritating features, which in my personal books is gluten and casein or dairy, but to really increase that diversity of foods and coach them on the why. Mm -hmm. Once they understand the why, people are a lot better at listening. Exactly. And then really incorporating all of those environmental aspects as well, or the terrain, ter terrain versus environment, however you want to put it. Um, but making sure that our clients understand, okay, well, what are they doing that alters the pH? Um, how is their circadian rhythm influencing their microbiome? And then what are they feeding their microbes and what sorts of things are they, are they exposed to on a daily basis that are impacting their microbes? So you really want to provide as optimal an environment as possible in order to make sure that your implants take and that they last for the long term. And I think some of the people that have been searching you out through info at tameoutcanada.com, you know, there are different places in their journey. Mm -hmm. Some of them have already been working on this for a while with their healthcare practitioner. That's often a naturopath or a gastroenterologist if they've got issues with SIBO um, or IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, or even the more dramatic ones, uh, the folks with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, so-called uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, because you need to have some of those issues optimized and under control. You know, if people are flaring with their Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, it's the wrong time to do a, a gut floral transplant. Similarly, if they've got a lot of problems with SIBO ahead of time, or a lot of candida overgrowth, you know, your practitioner needs to help with you so you can calm that down a lot. It may be a huge benefit in reducing the recurrence of those things, but you need to not have them flaring or a big issue at the time or you won't get the optimal response, will you? Yeah, exactly. And I'd love to jump back just to um, adequate processing and screening processes because it hasn't just been, I mean, the few deaths that I've heard of within this industry um, that have come up at least last year from uh, open biome in the United States, it seems like they're still not using adequate screening processes. So there were two people who died in the States from doing fecal transplant 
Um, they were, I guess, immunosuppressed and the implants contained a certain strain of E. coli uh, that Tamat has been screening for for 10 years. So, I mean, you just need to make sure that you are going through a clinic or if you're getting it done, just make sure that the implants are really screened properly. And I think I think the correct term now, because this has shifted recently in the UK, right, is, is TML labs. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. So unlike Tamon, so those, those are separate entities. One is the preparation group for optimization of the microbiome for the implants. And the other, on a bit like Tamon Bahamas or Tamon Slovakia or Tamon Canada, you know, that's where people receive the implants, get the coaching, have the colonic treatment and so on. So they're, they're two different groups. Lab is getting it ready and the other is, is installing it in clients. Right. And then from there, I guess we can, well, I can speak to a bit of the type of clientele that we usually see. So we, we do see a bit of everyone. We see IBS clients. Um, we do see IBD clients, definitely quite a few IBD clients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, we see a lot of autoimmune conditions. So like the multiple sclerosis, we see fibromyalgia, we see people with motility issues. We do see Lyme and we do see SIRS, so chronic inflammatory response syndrome um, and really it seems to be a beneficial piece for a, a part a part of the puzzle piece for resolving all of these conditions yeah and I, I think that's the way to to look at it is it's a significant puzzle piece one we haven't had the option with before although if you go back several thousand years yellow soup was used in China mm -hmm. even at that time which was probably based on a, a stool component within I don't know where the yellow comes from. We don't even go there. But, uh, you know, it's not a new concept per se, but it's much, much safer now and we understand it much better. And so the big thank you, of course, is to that DNA typing of the others. And you can hardly pick up a journal these days that doesn't have some discussion about microbiome enhancement to improve people's health. And they, I think the other important thing to talk about when we're talking about gut floral transplant is we are only looking at it as a complementary way to try and improve your general health. We don't use it as a treatment for diseases in any shape or form. And I think anybody with a, you know, integrated medicine, functional medicine background understands that kind of holistic approach. This is a piece of the puzzle to allow people to optimize their own health their own personal epigenetics and not per se to treat a disease. Exactly. This might be a good um, launching point for, we had a couple questions come in uh, this week mm -hmm. and one of the questions being, what are our thoughts on Lyme? Sure. So, you know, Lyme, of course, Borrelia, and sometimes it's accompanying illnesses is very much a problem in the people that we see because many of them have had repeated long-term antibiotics. So needless to say, their ordinary personal microbiome is fairly messed up. So what one can try and do there is you're trying to help them recover their microbiome for all the advantages it does. And one of those advantages, if you can enhance and optimize their microbiome again for them, then they know that they will have a more ideal, optimal immune system. So you haven't treated the Lyme per se, but you've treated one of the side effects, I guess, of all the medication that they've needed to, to cope with the Lyme components. And then from my perspective, for anyone with Lyme, I'd, I'd encourage you to um, just touch back on that environmental piece. So what things are making you susceptible to having chronic Lyme? And with our Lyme clients, I do see a lot of the time that they have um, mold exposure or heavy metal toxicity or some other form of toxicity. So these things might be influencing the environment and making you more susceptible to holding on to that infection. And it, the other corollary to that, and that's why there's a chapter in my book on chronic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS, it's very well done by Dr. Karen Johnson, who currently now lives in the island of Hawaii. But, uh, you know, she uses very much the Shoemaker protocol, which has its real advantages within that. And there's another, you know, group or series of groups 
working also on mold toxicity because mold toxicity is starting to to crop up as one of the major issues within our whole healthcare world. And so I see us at some point, we'll do a session just to try to give people a baseline of where they can go and start with, with that. Some of you are already on that journey, um, but you know, it's, it's important enough to now, it's often a piece that is missed. You know, it's estimated nearly 50% of the homes in Canada, the United States may well have some mold toxicity due to a flood or other issues that have created the problem. And uh, so that's a lot of exposure to people. And sometimes it's one piece of the puzzle that you haven't sorted well enough. And so your ability to recover optimal health is minimized. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Question number two that came in was, uh, how do I treat diverticulitis without antibiotics? So I'll let Dr. Code cover that one. Well, I mean, that's a challenging one. It depends where you are in the continuum of diverticulitis. Unfortunately, diverticulitis is really common in the general population. People get into their 50s and 60s. They've had low-grade constipation their entire life. They strain at stool. And what it is, is if, if you take if this is the colon and you've got here with the hole here, as they strain at the stool all the time, they increase increased pressure in the colon. And now you get a little outpouching, almost like an extra appendices of these little pieces of the wall of the colon are pushed outside. And then they act much like an appendix would if they get a small block into them. Now they're irritated, they're inflamed, as soon as you get on to inflammation, you're getting pain. Sometimes the whole deal, you're getting fever as well, and you're getting that whole region. So occasionally, yes, you end up going to hospital. It's flared. They're already worried that there's a relative infection in that local region. So sometimes they even go on to use antibiotics. Antibiotics is not a great long-term solution for diverticulitis, although if it settles down a localized infection in that appendix like region where it's blocked off fine it may prevent you needing surgery for it and removing that segment that's not a great solution either but you sure want to do something to change the whole can of worms before that diverticulum bursts or breaks open if it breaks open now you've got generalized peritonitis and you're really sick you're almost into the icu by now and so sometimes then they need to clean things up, take out that section of bowel because it's maybe become dead or necrotic. So diverticulitis is important to look after. So regular ongoing constipation is not a good idea. So you need to work things against that, more fluids, more fiber, uh, more magnesium, because that moves things through the gut in a, in a better fashion. And then you start to need to add components of fiber so that you've got less problems. In ongoing regular diverticulus, the old teaching has been, well, nothing with seeds or nothing with things that might block off the opening. But I think that's moved and fiber is what helps move things through and you want to do it. It won't be any solution at all in the acute diverticulitis attack. This is more in the long term to prevent the ongoing next ones because there will be more and as I say, it's pretty common. I would guess maybe 20, 30% of the population by the time they're in their 60s, 70s will have components of diverticuli. So that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I think that's mostly where it goes. You'll need help from somebody who really understands the illness. So that might be a gastroenterologist. Uh, it might be a functional medicine doc who's particularly skilled in that area and interested in that area or a naturopath. So you want to find something who's good at what they're doing to help you through that step. Perfect. And that's brought us to two o'clock. We don't have any other questions. Um, do you have anything else? No, I, I think uh, I want people to continue to listen to their healthcare providers. We're pretty lucky. We've got a, um, an excellent physician in charge of our public health here in British Columbia, Dr. Bonnie Henry. Most of those people are really comfortable with what they're doing. And I think we need to look after how we fit into the protocol 
And we need to have all the people that are giving us the guidance of what to do when within the Emergency Measures Act to keep an open mind and continue to look forward to when we can get people back to normal. I would encourage them to work hard at giving people, you can't always just use the stick, of course, you must give people hope and carrots that things are going to normalize. So whichever way they do that, I think in, in Austria, Last week, they embarked on having them open for children's clothing stores, hardware stores, do-it-yourself type home fixing hardware stores. But you've got to start to expand what people can do or they're going to rebel. And we also know they don't do well on their own lonely mm -hmm. as one or as a family that's in that little crucible together all the time. Problems are going to bubble up. You know, we already know children, children's abuse and family abuse is increasing. So we need to temper that and just not say lockdown for COVID-19 only. We've got to look at a more humanistic, holistic approach. And when can we start to move back toward normal? Exactly. Yeah. So we'll see you next Tuesday, 1 o'clock Pacific Daylight Time. And we'll look forward to your questions. Send in questions, comments. We much appreciate it. You can get more of these. And if you've got friends that don't do Facebook, you can send them to drbillcode.com and they can click on blog and they can get all the previous ones that we've done, as well as some of the other ones I do, because I do other podcasts with uh, pointofreturn.com, for example, and access you know, to the book, which has many of these principles in it. Um, how you can maintain or regain your optimal health for your brain, but the brain, the gut, all terribly tied together. So stay well, be well, and we'll see you next time. Okay, and if you have any topics you would like us to cover on the Facebook Lives, uh, feel free to send us a message about those as well, and we'll definitely take them into consideration. Uh, okay, bye for now. See you next Tuesday.